For those of you who are new to Wild Ones, we are a membership organization devoted to promoting the use of native plants to create sustainable landscapes. We carry out our mission through educational programs and provide resources such as the Wild Ones Journal, Native Garden Designs, Seeds for Education Grants, and other educational webinars. At the local level, Wild Ones chapters deliver area programs, including garden tours, speakers, conferences, and seed exchanges. If you are not a Wild Ones member, we hope you join us and take advantage of the camaraderie and support that come with being a part of a local chapter. Our critical mission needs you. Wild Ones chapters are where members put mission into action. We get our hands dirty and learn by doing. Chapters are actively recruiting officers and volunteers to plan upcoming events. Chapter activities require the time and talents of many different people to coordinate. Amplify the impact you have on the native plant movement by sharing your skills and enthusiasm with others. Please reach out to your local chapter to find out how you can get involved. If there isn't a chapter near you, now's the time to consider starting a Wild One Seedling chapter. Chapter founders across the country connect and collaborate with one another for mutual support and guidance. If you are eager to advance the mission and cultivate support for native plants in your area, visit the Start a Chapter page on the Wild Ones website. Wild Ones inspires people and communities across the country to transform home landscapes into vibrant and essential habitats for all forms of life. Programs like this would not be possible without generous support from our members, donors, and folks like you attending Wild Ones programs. Please consider donating to Wild Ones today by visiting donate.wildones.org. Thank you for joining us for the Wild Ones Native Garden Design Series. My name is Lisa Olson, and I will be your host for this discussion. I joined Wild Ones in 2018 and am a former president, now member, of the Wild Ones Front Range chapter in Colorado. I now work for Wild Ones as the chapter liaison, providing support and guidance for our growing number of chapters. We haven't yet planted a Wild Ones seedling chapter in New Mexico, if you are interested in helping one take root, please reach out and we can chat about growing a community of support for native plants where you live. I am happy to be talking today with David Cristiani, the designer of Wild Ones Las Cruces Native Garden Design. Wild Ones Native Garden Designs follow the premise that native plant landscaping can be beautiful, beneficial, and achievable for gardeners of all skill sets in terms of scope and budget. This program contains resources that include information on how to get started by identifying your ecoregion, selecting and determining plant placement in your yard, considering your specific climate conditions, and finding local native plant nurseries in your area. The program also features a growing number of free, downloadable native garden designs created by professional landscape designers representing various eco-regions across the U.S. A plant list accompanies each design and provides a quick preview of the diversity and beauty of the native plants incorporated into the design. Also included are designer notes, which outline a phased approach to installation. All these materials can be downloaded and printed easily at home. The designs are assembled using native plants that provide habitat and food for wildlife and offer a colorful and beautiful garden throughout the growing season. We hope these resources encourage and motivate you on your native garden journey. We are honored to have designer David Cristiani with us today to share his creative insights on his approach to preparing the site, selecting plants, and designing home landscapes in the Las Cruces, New Mexico area. David Cristiani is a former landscape architect and planner and currently owns and operates a design consultation firm called Quercus. His work emphasizes plant palettes and hardscape elements that are appropriate for this arid region and reflect the natural sense of place of the Southwest. David uses strong, bold forms with simple masks, masses in his designs, <clears throat> which are inspired by how plants are spaced and provide habitat in the powerful 
but dry Western wilds. David earned a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Design from the University of Oklahoma, which included coursework and ongoing research in geography and meteorology. He's lived and practiced landscape design across the dry Southwestern United States. David's projects range in scale from small residences to streetscapes and community college and healthcare campuses. David has shared his views on site appropriate design and publications, presentations and interviews. You can follow David on Instagram and his blog appropriately called, It's a Dry Heat. Welcome, David. Thank you. It's nice to be here talking about this very important topic that is finally gaining ground. Yeah, we are excited by the momentum and interest, the surge of interest that we're seeing in native landscaping. And I am very excited to discuss the challenges of landscaping in a dry region uh, and learn more about the Chihuahuan Desert. So David, for those of us who are less familiar with the Las Cruces area, would you please comment okay. on the, oh. the weather? and the, the climate conditions, um, seasons, temperatures, the patterns that you see in your area? Okay, that's, uh, it's fairly easy. It was a foreign place when I moved uh, to New Mexico well, over 20, you know, 30 years ago now. But the most interesting part of our climate, other than the fact that it's very dry and very sunny, is we have five seasons here in New Mexico, and a lot of people don't talk about that, especially, namely here in Las Cruces in the Chihuahuan Desert. We're the opposite of the West Coast. We're not summer dry. Summer is when we hope to get most of our rain because that's when we get it. We get over 50% of our rain from about early July till the middle or end of September. And the rest of the year, we can get really dry but of course, that other 50% of the precipitation falls sporadically throughout the period. But anyway, we have five seasons, um, starting with early winter. I guess winter here centers on New Year's Day just about. So it's about a month or two either side of it. I like to call it winter light because we have the spotty occurrence of hard freezes mixed in with occasional storm systems that can give us some light rain, even a couple inches of snow most years. The rest of the time it's sunny and dry. And I would say it varies between mild, much of the time to downright chilly. And once every 10 years or 20 years, we get into a deep freeze and we've been below zero in all those times. It's it's but it's, it's the uh, exception, not the rule, but you can count on that. So think about the lifespan of a tree. For 10 years or even 20 years, that tree that is not used to much cold is often fine here. Then comes the dreaded um, super freeze that comes out of the north and moves in from the east over the mountains like the mountains aren't even there. And when that happens, we drop below zero, we can drop below freezing for three or four days straight sometimes. Those trees that do well in Tucson suddenly die. And so it's a good idea to work more with what's native to this area and can handle our quirks because they don't, those sorts of plants don't experience that in their native habitat, but here they do. So that's one of the things I'd like to point out about winter, uh, but it varies between mild to chilly weather and few plants flower grow right now because it's one of our dormant seasons. We have a couple. Now our second season is spring. Everybody from the east or even the west coast thinks of spring as a time where it's suddenly very verdant and green and everything's growing rapidly. That does happen here to a point because we rapidly warm up. Our springs probably warm up faster than a lot of the country because we're so dry and we're so far south. Uh, I'm the same latitude as Charleston or Savannah in the southeast. I am further south in San Diego. I'm in northern. I'm in the equivalent of northern Baja California, and it's at 4,000 feet elevation. And without much moisture and that sun, we tend to warm up really fast. There's really no seasonal lag here. 
And what happens is when it warms up from cold weather, we get periodic strong winds because the cold fronts are still sweeping across to our north, especially over Colorado. And the way the pressure systems work, we'll often get strong winds usually once a week. We might get them for one or two days at the most. They die down at night, but they make it even drier, which is not what we need. So the plants respond. We also get dust storms occasionally. I wouldn't say those happen every week, but we get several of them most springs. And that just makes it unpleasant to be outside. And it's not really healthy to be outside when that happens. And at that point, um, I would say the soils, because they're so much warmer, we start getting a lot of plant growth. But once the temperatures start warming up, which is at the end of spring, towards maybe the end of April, early May, you start seeing the growth on many plants slow down or just stop, which seems really odd because they should be happy. But the plants know, they know how to respond. Even plants not from here know how to respond when suddenly it becomes more like a hair dryer outside or a convection oven. And once we start reaching the 90s regularly, the wind goes away. And that's how I define summer, which is the third season. The winds start decreasing, the heat cranks up, but of course it's a dry heat. So that's supposed to make it all better, but it doesn't make it better for the plants or even for people sometimes. Uh, you need lip balm and you need SPF 50 here to uh, be outside for any length of time because by the time you're getting into May, which is when our summer begins, usually about a week or two into May, the nights are nice and cool. They're often in the 40s and 50s when you wake up in the morning. And by 10 a.m., they're knocking on the 80-degree door. By 1 o'clock, it's usually 90. And when that happens, that's the start of summer here. And it may be a dry heat, but that's when the plants start to slow down things a little bit. They're waiting for something else, and that'll be our next season. But for right now, nights cool nicely. Once you get into June, the sun is higher, the days are even a little bit longer. There's no frontal systems influencing us at all. The nights start getting warmer to the point where you're gonna say, I need a fan to be out on my porch. It's a little bit warm tonight. It's dry heat, but it's still heat. And when you wake up in the morning, it's refreshing, but it might be 65 degrees. And by the time you get to early July, you've already gone through probably a week of 100 degree weather. And during June, which is often our hottest month, we can sometimes have two or three weeks of temperatures between 100 and 105. Our all-time record's 110. And we've hit close to that uh, two years in the last six. And one of those years turned out to be a fairly mild, very wet summer. The other summer was 2020, and we all know about 2020. And the weather was just as crazy. And we had, we had, uh, I think we had over 40 days over 100. So that can happen too. And that summer, the next season, which is our fourth season, failed. Usually it doesn't. Late summer is our fourth season. So early summer is our third season. It goes from May into early July. Well, from early July into sometime in mid-late September is our fourth season. We call it the monsoon season. Now, we're not next to a tropical ocean like India is or the Arabian Peninsula. So we don't quite have the dramatic storms that they get in parts of South Asia. They're dramatic nonetheless, and they always have been. Um, nothing's really changed with those. But the monsoon season is simply a seasonal wind shift because of all that heat. The high pressure cell that causes that starts moving north. And then it picks on Las Vegas, Nevada, and Western Colorado, and the Four Corners region, and leaves us with a wind that switches to the east, kind of like tropical trade winds, and it pulls in moisture from the Gulf of Mexico. And at certain times, it pulls in moisture from the Gulf of California or the Eastern Pacific. When those combine, we have the start of the monsoon season. 
which kind of makes it up into the Colorado Rockies quite a bit, but you have other things going on down here. The winds are pretty consistently out of the southeast, and we start getting afternoon thunderstorms. And even when the third season is still going, you'll see those clouds starting to build up over the mountains to the east especially. Well, the monsoon season starts. They don't just build up over the, over the area. They move off the mountains into the valley. They sometimes move from the southeast, sometimes from the northwest or south. It depends on the local wind conditions. But then we get thunderstorms. And sometimes they kick off with a dust storm. You, you've heard about the haboobs that they get in Phoenix. Well, we get them too. So anyway, that's the, that's the fourth season. The humidity goes up because of that moisture. It wouldn't be noticeable if you're from the East Coast or the South. But you will notice it here because when we're going from dew points in the 20s and 30s in early June, and meaning the humidity is maybe 10% in the afternoon, when it goes up to 30%, you do notice it. The good thing is, is because we're so high here in elevation that the sun tends to settle that humidity and either burns it off like a fog or it rises up into the atmosphere. And so it usually doesn't return until well after dark. And it's not a suffocating humidity like you get in parts of East Texas or Oklahoma, Kansas and that. It's more of a moderate humidity that just, you notice that you perspire more. And when you're out in the garden, you also notice something else that happens. Overnight from a thunderstorm, the monsoon season doesn't mean you get rain every afternoon, at least not in Las Cruces because we're in a valley. The mountains might, we don't, but we get, um, enough thunderstorms in the area, it'll either cool the air down, sometimes for the entire night, sometimes just for a few hours, or it'll drop it into the 60s and 70s and the breeze is refreshing. But when it rains, within a day or two, all the plants in your garden that look dry and desiccated, especially following, you know, our average of, you know, 15 to 25 days above 100, even if it's 101, or it's 107 for a couple days, those plants are desiccated. And that rain and that humidity and just dropping the high temperatures back down to the low mid 90s changes everything. The plants green up. And this includes our most drought tolerant native plants. You see cactus perk up. Their pads become nice and full like they were trying to do in the spring before that all got thwarted by the dry heat. Well, now it's a moderate heat and the heat lessens up. Plants start to put on some kind of growth, often a lot of growth by the end of August and September. And that leaves us to the fifth season fall. The winds start to shift. That high pressure starts moving south again. But now, instead of it making us super hot, it just makes us very warm and dry. And that usually happens towards the end of September, but you see hints of it in August. But usually it's around the first day of fall is when you start feeling it, the last week of September. And our highs will start dropping into the 80s, which may sound really hot if you're in Wisconsin or maybe even, you know, the Ozarks or somewhere like that or the West Coast. But trust me, 80s is a lot better than the 110 days we average every year over 90. And there really hasn't been a break because when we turn on one season, it tends to stick. And it just sticks for the longest time. And then suddenly something sets the next season into place. So fall, the wind shifts back to the west, the moisture moves away from us, it stays more in Mexico, and eventually it even moves out of Mexico to the coasts. The winds are just light enough um, to not be a nuisance and just enough in strength to moderate the still 85 degree days when you're starting fall. But we rarely get big wind storms and dust storms. And many think fall here is the best season um, of all of our seasons. And they all have their points. And it's nice that we have five seasons because if we had too much summer or too much of any season, it might get a little old. <laughs> and so now the plants actually 
grow more than probably any time of the year because unlike spring, they're not cut off by that sudden heating up of the atmosphere. It's a gradual cool down. And 2020 is probably the only year that I've seen something so drastic. We literally went from highs in the low 80s into late October to the first day ever of it stayed below freezing all day before Halloween and it snowed off and on all day. We've never had accumulating snow here going back 120 years in the records until 2020. But that's the appropriate year that would happen. So I know I've dated this talk a little bit, but we're moving on from 2020. So fortunately, yeah. the plants start growing and our soil moisture is up because of the monsoon. And then we'll go back to the first season eventually. I will admit I, I I'm, a fan of, I'm a fan of fall. I, I, I love that season and, and, um, and you've painted an amazing picture of what it's like to, to live and garden in the region in terms of the various challenges, the wind, the, the variable humidity, the thunderstorms, the altitude, uh, the intensity of the sunlight. So thank you for, for going into such depth because it is a unique climate that, that you're looking at there. Um, are there any other factors you would point to in terms of what um, gardens need to thrive or, or the conditions you said fall because it, it's sort of that mellow season in terms of, of temperature. That's, that's sort of the sweet spot. Is that when the plants really start to kick in and bloom? Is, is, is that when you see a lot of, a lot of plants um, showing a, a sort of a second flush of life? <laughs> Yeah, but the second flush seems to be better because the temperatures are more moderate. It seems like we have less of a range. And we can sometimes get, I, I've had two of the several years I've lived down here, what, nine years now, that I've seen freezes in mid-April. Now, there are light freezes. You know, they're 30 degrees and it's for an hour. But it tends to limit things. And then within a week, you might hit you know, 92 again, you know, we're talking the end of April, mid April. And that, I think it always hits that. So that spring, but spring seems to be a little more variable because winter is still wanting to assert itself and in fall, summer doesn't seem to assert itself as much because I think of the rain and the soils are more moist. And we often, I hear Texans call it this and I, I have to agree for at least Albuquerque, Las Cruces, El Paso area, it's our second spring. Um, while in Texas, where it's definitely hotter and lower elevation, they call it patio season. And to a point, you can go out and enjoy your patio more here, but you can still enjoy it early in the morning here because our lows are usually at 70 or a few degrees below at the hottest time of the year. And in the fall, the lows are in the 50s to low 60s to start it. And then they sometimes don't get out of the 60s by, you know, October until towards noon or 10 o'clock in the morning. So it's, it is kind of like a second spring, except we get more growth. So we almost have two flowering seasons. Everybody knows about the desert blooming in the Sonoran Desert in Southern California. And if we have enough rain in the winter, we sometimes get that too. We're hoping for that this year, but it's so far it's staying over in Arizona. If we get that, we have Mexican gold poppies and some other native species that are native from here to, to Southern California. And they'll act just like we're in California in April and May. And then there's last year where that never happened because we had zero rain, except a little bit of sleet in March, I think. We had zero rain from around Christmas all the way probably into June at some point in parts of town zero that's that's a hard road to hoe in terms of just survival i mean the plants must just sort of hunker down <laughs> and wait the plants are patient and and they know eventually it will come but but yeah they need to be able to endure those those really hot dry spells i want since you've touched on the folks in in texas i want to talk a little bit about the the design and the fact that the plant list that you've plants you selected were native to the Chihuahuan Desert, the Northern Desert and the, the Las Cruces area, would apply also to El Paso and locations uh, ranging along the 
3,500, 4,500 foot elevation uh, along that southern U.S.-Mexico border. But what might need to be considered for folks in other parts of the state. You mentioned Albuquerque, up north we have Santa Fe, closer to the mountains, um, and then also those those folks in West Texas. What what might they need to adapt in terms of plants if they were to um, look at this design and, and adapt it for their location? Well, with strictly native species, um, if you were to stay within that elevation range, either side of 4,000 feet elevation, that'll take you up to the eastern outskirts of Tucson almost, and it will take you all, almost all the way to the Pecos River in West Texas, although that's a little bit lower and hotter than that. And they get some Gulf influence over there that we don't, so they get a little more humidity. But generally, a lot of the native plants are the same because that's all the Chihuahuan Desert. That's what makes this really easy. Where the map misses it is going north. They stop the Chihuahuan Desert right about just below the middle of the state, and it actually goes up just to the north of Albuquerque a little bit. And you can tell that by the overall climatology and the growing season and the native species, because I'd say about two thirds of our native species go continue up to Albuquerque and just north of Albuquerque. Now, Santa Fe is different because it is at the edge of the Rocky Mountains and the plateau. So for here, and the southern third of New Mexico, pretty much where you see that light green, and even some of the lower mountains, you have most of the same species. And really what you need to deal with are some plants can struggle and just expect that because they have more up and down weather further east in West Texas. So you can use probably 99% of the plants from Las Cruces that are native in Midland Odessa, for example, or Pecos or Alpine or Marfa, but just know that, that they have more variability during the spring because some of the same weather that happens in Denver and the Great Plains goes right down to there because as I learned in college, when I studied meteorology originally, the professor said, you who aren't from Oklahoma, we have only some barbed wire fences separating us from the North Pole, and we only have some barbed wire fences separating us from the tropics. And he said, and that's why you're here to study meteorology. There's no better place in the country to study it. And on the east side of the state, it's just a drier version of Oklahoma or Kansas, you know, it's, or, or you know, central Texas. It's, it's, it's highly variable. But there's very few plants that aren't native in all those areas from east of Tucson to, you know, Fort Stockton, Texas, up, you know, a third of the way north in New Mexico. Now, when you want to move into higher elevations, and I mentioned Marfa, Texas, there's hardly anybody who lives there, but everybody knows where it is. It's like Santa Fe. Santa Fe is the fourth largest town in New Mexico, ask most people. And if they know a town in New Mexico, and it's usually Santa Fe, well, that's Marfa too. Mm -hmm. Well, Marfa is almost 5,000 feet, so it's about a mile high. Albuquerque is about 5,000 feet. Socorro is almost that. And Silver City is about 6,000 feet. And so there's a number of communities in the Chihuahuan Desert or just outside of it that have some of the same species too. I'd say, you know, two thirds of the species do grow in Albuquerque. The temperatures are, are fairly similar in the summer, but the winters are, you know, several degrees colder and they get more snow frequently. Whereas here it snows two out of every three years, usually about an inch. In Albuquerque, it snows several times in that inch or two inches. And you can count on it there. So same with Silver City, Marfa, Texas is no stranger to that. And the growing seasons are shorter. So in this whole belt that I mentioned, 4,000 feet at this latitude, we have about a 240 day growing season. They have about a 200 day growing season. And cold spots might only, might only have 180 days. And of course, each year varies a little bit. And that's been going on for a long time, as long as I've lived in this area. So sometimes <laughs> even milder areas like Las Cruces might only get a 200 day growing season. But so you, rest you assured, roll, you roll in the dice. 
rolling the dice then if you want to plant a beefsteak tomato and actually or a big heirloom and, and actually get a yield because the growing season is variable and you, you might not get you might not get fruit <laughs> um i want to move yeah, a little I bit somebody, i know somebody that grew tomatoes on the east side of town and she only had a couple light freezes and i think she just threw a blanket over them and they were fine yep you might lose the basil but yeah the Tomatoes usually can tough out an hour's worth of 30 degrees. Um, uh, let's get into some, some climate issues because uh, I know the Southwest, I mean, you mentioned kind of the roller coaster weathers, the high lows, the, I, I currently live just south of Denver, so I am well acquainted <laughs> with those, those extremes that, that roll over us. Um, and so if you could speak a little bit to some of the climate condition changes that you've observed over the last 10, 20 years, uh, just touch well, base what I've observed, Well, what I've observed is moving 30 years ago to, I lived in Santa Fe briefly and then Albuquerque, and that was quite a temperature difference. Santa Fe is like a cooler, milder version of Denver and it's semi-arid barely. Then you come down to Albuquerque and it's different where we get these real strong five seasons, especially the early summer and late summer contrast between super dry heat and pretty wet and everything comes to life. And what happens, th this is something I found interesting. People say that the climate has changed a lot and well, it does. And I think it's gotten warmer overall, especially the summers and the growing season going up by a week or two. But most of what's happened is when I moved, that was the wettest decade, apparently, in over 100 years. The 1990s averaged something like 10 to 25 percent more rainfall than any previous decade. The driest decades were in the 50s. And in the 2010 time period, either you know, a few years around that, it got dry again, but never as bad as the 1950s. I know people who are in their 70s and 80s now who told me when they were, when they were kids in the 1950s, the monsoon season was much weaker, and they said the monsoon season has never been as predictable as the 1990s, that this is more normal, actually, is what they say. Excuse me. <coughs> The, um, the, the 90s brought consistent monsoon seasons and a few good El Ninos that brought moisture in the winter. And so people got used to that, especially if you're like me and you arrived at that time of the, in time when we were getting wetter weather, sure enough, it became more variable. So that's one of the things. If you said your, say your base point is a wetter period, everything's going to be a drought. If you come during a dry year, you're going to be surprised at how much it rains in the summer. But of course, being we're arid and we're a desert, it tends to rain more. Um, just at that time of the year and the rest of the year is dry. So I think part of that climate change is real and part of it is, it depends what time period you're looking at. Now, I, of course, am a, I, I'm, a, I'm a data junkie. And so I went ahead when the new climatology came out for 1991 to 2020, I put it into a spreadsheet because I couldn't find the data online anywhere. <clears throat> and I wanted to see what USDA zone is Las Cruces. Did it really change? I'm not buying this zone 8A. And sure enough, it changed. And We've gone up from 8A before the 1990s to 8B, right in the middle of it. That's five degrees. That's a significant change. I, I know um, Denver was sort of on the cusp of getting upgraded from a five to a six. And then I want to say it was 2015 when a polar vortex hit and we had a 70 degree drop in a matter of hours. And uh, they, they, they backed off on zone six for a while. <laughs> they, they said, yeah, probably better to stick with zone five. We're, we're gonna get to minus 20 at some point. And it might only be for uh, a short spell, but it's enough to kill trees in 
a matter of hours. So uh, having plants that are just well adapted to a region's historic sort of temperature extremes is, is extremely important. Um, and I would love for you to sort of touch on some of the um, physiological characteristics, uh, the sort of survival strategies that desert plants um, uh, that you've incorporated into the design, some of those strategies that those plants exhibit? Yeah. Um, one of the strategies are small leaves. So you'll notice a lot of our trees, even our native oaks in the foothills have smaller leaves than oaks do in the coastal regions, especially the middle of the country and further east. And that's just a simple way of shunning that bright sunlight and not desiccating and drying up as much. <clears throat> I would say another strategy, you'll notice a lot of the plants don't have dark green leaves, but sometimes they have blue green leaves. Sometimes they shed their leaves, they're drought deciduous. We don't have that as bad as Arizona does. But our creosote bushes that are all around my neighborhood, they have a nice olive green leaf during that late spring and early summer part of the year, they, the leaves actually shrivel up slightly. They're still green, they're still flexible. And so they're almost wanting to become deciduous. We'd have a number of shrubs like tar bush that's out in the wild, you can't buy it in any nursery. It looks like it's the middle of winter when that season hits. And then magically it greens right up in August when we have enough rain. I would say fuzzy leaves are another item. Those hairs are one, are one defense mechanism against the sun. And of course, cactus have tiny little green leaves on those big pads. These agaves that are in this picture right here, those are that pale blue-green foliage that helps to reflect some of the sunlight. So it's the plant photosynthesizes, but it doesn't um, absorb too much of the uh, UV rays. And that those are the main factors I can think of. And I think I mentioned seasonally deciduous, but I also mentioned drought deciduous. But seasonally deciduous is kind of like drought deciduous, except it's dependent more on temperature. So if it's really hot, but usually really cold, the plants will shed their leaves and some do. You know, a lot of our trees, desert willows do. So I think that may have answered the question there. Yeah. Um, I, I want to also note that, that there is a broad misconception that, that deserts are wastelands and that nothing will survive in a desert. And when the reality is just the opposite, I mean, deserts are incredibly diverse and they are teeming with life. And if you could talk a bit about the wildlife that, that this design, this garden will attract and, and how this design supports and preserves plant and wildlife species that are native to your local ecosystem? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. One of my favorite quotes I read on somebody's blog when she was a, a, a teacher or professor somewhere in the upper Midwest and she moved to Arizona and so desert Southwest. And she said, when I, I didn't move to a desert when I came here, I moved to a garden. Well, she's an avid hiker, an outdoors person, and she saw the species diversity. And she may have came, come up with that term by one, just one monsoon season, watching the desert go from dry and desiccated to suddenly lush green. Everything's flowering and growing, even though you know you have to you have to put up a little extra humidity. I'm not sure, but she did move to a garden. It's just a different garden. And as far as our plants in the wild, they can take all these weather extremes that we get, even though we're normally just sunny and dry and not really too hot or too cold here in Las Cruces, um, for very long at least. These plants, over and over, even in one plant's lifetime, let's say it's 20 years, let's say another plant like a tree, like a mesquite can live 80 years or 150 years. Imagine all the cycles they've gone through. And while we're warming, 
I think our summers are longer and they come earlier and the heat waves last longer. We never used to get heat waves as long as we do now. We can sometimes get 15 days straight where it's running five to 10 degrees above average. And it seems like that used to get broken more easily. If that's cyclical, I don't know. Uh, if it's due to increased CO2 in the atmosphere, that's certainly possible. Um, I don't see why it wouldn't be. Those plants that are from this area can take the record highs. We still don't see most summers and they can still take the record lows that still happen. They may not happen with as much frequency, but they turn around and zap us. And we're, not, we're not paying attention. It's often in the warmest winters, we get the extreme cold as well. So everybody's trying to be a little bit like Denver, I guess you could say, when that happens. And, but our plants are able to adapt to our huge range that we naturally have. And whether we know at some point that we'll need to use plants from another zone warmer uh, remains to be seen so far. I haven't seen it yet, but those plants can certainly live several years before we get cold again, just for a few days, and that takes them out. But the key is, is to work with the plants and maximize the amount of water infiltration you get to the soil, because that's always happened. But if that happens in nature everywhere, that's why there's trees along the river and there aren't trees generally out in the desert, unless there's a dry wash or arroyo that feeds some of that stormwater to the roots. Go anywhere else, there's hardly any trees. Well, in our gardens, because we have a house with a roof or even commercial buildings with roofs, we really need to emphasize using those natural patterns of how moisture moves to work one and one with our landscapes and our planting choices. So native low water use plants that are from our elevation range give them extra opportunities for stormwater to soak in. One person refers it to planting the rain. So that's what we want to do. We want to plant the I rain. I know that person. At least I think I know, you know that, that person. person. <laughs> are you Paul talking? Redheaded or beard. Oh yeah. Yeah, I know Brad Lancaster. Um, I had yeah. the delight, delightful pleasure of, of taking a week-long uh, workshop with him. He was up just outside of Denver, and we spent uh, what was wonderful. It actually rained while while we were doing the class, and we all ran out with our with our just to pay attention as to where the rain wanted to go, and and we were making design recommendations based on what Mother Nature was showing us which is actually a great segue into, into what we want to move on to next, which is talking about the design and the details. Obviously, you learn a lot from your natural surroundings and the things that you need to pay attention to um, when um, evaluating a, a site and planning a design. So if you want to maybe touch a little bit about your approach to developing a design. Sure. The design as the slide sort of points out, it is all about decreasing heat so you can create an extended outdoor living area. So in other words, in our climate, I think probably about you know nine tenths of the year, there's some point during the day where you can enjoy being outside. Even if it's for two or three hours at sunrise, having your cup of coffee, even if it's, uh, in the afternoon on a cool day like today, uh, or a windy day, you go out before the wind hits, or you go out after the wind dies down. There's so much time, so you may as well extend that outdoor space um, for living. Don't just keep it indoors. And that's one of the reasons I moved to New Mexico, so I could live outdoors part of the year. It's not just the people in California or Hawaii that can do that, but we can do that too. So I created extra outdoor living spaces, and then I know that I have a roof that drains water. I have a patio. I have sidewalks. And so I've created areas that instead of the land running all that water off, I've got these water harvesting basins, or what's called an Easter rain garden. I've got those spaced where it's safe, and it's not going to interfere with existing tree roots. I've identified at the upper left part of the plant and the upper the lower right part of the plan, 
without any color an existing tree in each location. So there's going to be tree roots. And so there aren't as many plants under there because sometimes you're conflicting with tree roots. You don't want to do that. You want that tree to keep living. <coughs> you also want um, extra water at that root zone. Sometimes people remove lawn to put in these plants. Here in Las Cruces, some do, but lawns aren't as common here. But you still want to make sure there's a lot of water getting to those tree roots so they're healthy and they continue to live and provide their you know, ecological services. Um, of cleaning the air, providing habitat, shade, everything else we want. And then I plant heavily in those basin areas that get more water. And away from the basin areas, I use lower water plants. So in the basin areas, I use a lot of ornamental grasses. And away from them, that's where I might use something that's more xeric, like prickly pear cactus. And you don't need to use a lot of prickly pear cactus because one can cover, depending on the species, four or five feet, and they make such a visual impact. If you plant four or five in an area, it better be a really large area because a lot of times that can swallow a front yard. And you can see how this front yard is laid out. I also not only wanted to create a few more outdoor living areas that are on the small front porch and the back deck, but I made the deck a little larger. Now, just so you know, we don't use decks here because wood doesn't last very long in the desert. But well, let's pretend it's just a large stoop. And so I made it, and so you walk right out into the backyard, where then you have a fire pit further away from the house and a water feature and a place to sit. So if you want to drag some chairs around, you can. You can have a table out there and enjoy it. And in the front yard, I have a, something much smaller, like a little bistro table with two chairs. I also have another way to walk to the front door instead of using the one car garage driveway. But it breaks it up, but yet there's continuity of how the plants flow through the space. Uh, I've also masked plants. And I didn't put any trees on the side yard because I don't know what the neighbor has. If I did know what the neighbor has or the side yard was larger, I'd probably put in something. So I use some vertical elements, like some of our native yuccas that'll get tall and you can walk under. But if you had a wider side yard, you could certainly use a small tree. Uh, in the backyard, I use different trees than what I used in the front. And looking at my plant list, in the back, I use nut hackberry, and in the front, I use desert willow. And both of those provide a lot of habitat for wildlife, plus they provide shade. And the desert willows are hummingbird magnets, and in the evening, there are sphinx moth magnets. And then, of course, if you bring in sphinx moths in the evening or at night, we have a lot of bats here in Las Cruces, especially where I live. And the bats eat the moths. And so it's this wonderful food site, this wonderful uh, cycle of life that goes on out in our garden when we plant these that you don't get when it's an all rock landscape. Lizards don't even like all rock. And if it's an all lawn landscape so with all the fertilizer people have to use to keep those lawns happy here, you tend not to have any insects, no insects, no birds. Would you want to live in a place that was 500 miles from a grocery store if you didn't know how to grow your own food? Of course not. Well, they can't really grow their own food, although some birds here do know how to move seed around. <laughs> they oh, must yeah. know something. But if you just have a lawn or just gravel, there's nothing, there's no seed for them to eat or move around and plant. So that's how I think of how the landscape works. And, I, and of course, where we sit outdoors, I wanna have the understanding for, for a client or even myself that you can't use every space every time of the day here because it's either too sunny or it's too cool. And, and you know, in the cooler times of the year. So, Part of this is using that patio in the front yard when the sun's not shining on you midday in June. But that's where you probably shouldn't be outside when it's over 100 degrees for that long, unless you have a certain you know, or real reason to be out there. But in the winter, you could sit out and enjoy that on a sunny 60 degree day, and it's gonna feel like paradise. You may have to wear a sweater or a light jacket most days, but you can enjoy it.
And in the evening, you can be out and enjoy that back patio that, that's either up high by the house or the gravel one that's more informal further back because that one per, is permeable and it allows water when it rains to soak in and soak the surrounding plantings. And all those plantings attract hummingbirds, attract butterflies, they attract bees. And ju just when people hear bees, they get really scared because some people are allergic to bee stings. I can tell you there's a lot bigger hazards than a bee sting. And all the times I've been out in a garden, I have never once been stung by a bee. I have only been stung by a wasp twice. And one of those times I was measuring somebody's landscape in, I think it was May, and it was a beautiful warm day and they had some landscape timbers that they were going to reuse somewhere else. I got near them and I saw one wasp circling. Well, there were about 10 or 15 wasps that suddenly decided that I was uh, invading their space and they hit me. They and I got, you. I got stung a couple times and it felt like nails being driven to my bone. And as much as I'm outside sitting by water features that would attract wasps and bees, I have, that's one of the only times I've ever been stung. Because when you encroach on their the territory. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You've mentioned water and, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about irrigation and, and, and the water harvesting in just a moment. But I, I, I want to mention that, that of the designs that we've compiled this year, um, many included bird baths, but yours, at least thus far, has, has been the only one I've seen that included a running water feature. And I want, was hoping that you could just touch on a little bit how important that is, especially in an arid region to pro provide a, a source of running water. Yeah, well, I'm a big fan of bird baths, and even sometimes people will take a very shallow terracotta container and put a drip emitter to it, or just manually fill it every few days or let the rain do it, because I, sometimes I have seen in an exceptional year, when the monarchs are mi migrating through, we'll see them, you know, hanging out in these real shallow pools of water in an arroyo out in the wild. And you'll see it in the yard too. And I have seen butterflies bathe after I soak the soil manually with a hose. They'll come from, I, I didn't see them before, and they, they must be able to smell the water, feel the cooler air. They go right towards it and just sit in it. And yeah, just like a mermaid would in the ocean, I suppose. <laughs> and to me, the fountain provides white noise if you live near traffic, where I don't live, but most people do live where there's a lot of traffic, even if it's a freeway, you have the fountain, you have the sound of water, it starts taking your mind away from all the chaos. Running water in a fountain is interesting too, because you would think it keeps the water clear, but during the day, uh, it might at night, it puts a lot of extra oxygen in the water. And when the temperatures cool down, we get a lot of algae growth. So it's best to turn your fountain off in the evening and at night. If you're out there observing it, that's one thing. But if you go to bed, and you're not going to be outside, turn the fountain off. And in my case, I like to just use these simple rock water features. They blend in. They're very man-made. They don't look like a waterfall fall, but at the same time, they don't look out of place either because the plantings then shine and the landscape shines with a hardscape and, and, and all your colors of your plants and your flowers and foliage. So that's why I do that. Uh, let me think of what other uses of water that one, can, that one can do, but that's probably it because the fountain provides that sound and I don't think it cools the air at all because a small fountain that that's in the slide, for example, you know, it's 18 inches, two feet across, sometimes less than that. And that, evap that little bit of water that goes into the air evaporates so fast. So you have to keep it filled up, but it's a very low water feature compared to some things. I, I, 
I don't think it ever impacted my bill to have my water bill to have a fountain that I filled up every two or three days. But having a lawn would do that. Taking one hour of showers would probably do that. Well, I know um, in terms of bathing, you mentioned the butterflies bathing, the uh, a fountain just like this one. I have seen on numerous occasions, I've seen hummingbirds bathe. They, they sit sort of on the edge and they just kind of splash around. It's just the right depth. Whereas they wouldn't go to a, a bird bath that, that just has a sort of steep sides. They love this little spot where the water flows over the edge of the rock and, and they'll just perch there and, and, and take a little bit of a, a bath. So uh, I, yeah, fountains, especially in a, in a dry climate, it's just provides that essential water source uh, for residents and migrating wildlife. And, and yes, as a, a element of, of pleasure for the, for the homeowner and the, the person dwelling in the garden as well. I do want to not allow a time to talk about those really essential features that you included in your design, those rainwater harvesting basins, they are critical. And uh, especially in that, that dry region. So if you could touch a, just a bit on the, the sort of mechanics of passive rainwater harvesting and whether or not these are common, whether you see these a lot around the Las Cruces area. They are less common in Las Cruces than they became in Albuquerque, but they're still very uncommon in both places. And El Paso, people still treat water as a nuisance. You'll hear engineers and homeowners, other clients often say, well, they want to move this water off because it's, it's going to attract mosquitoes. And it's going to cause my stucco to peel and other things like that. And some of that is true. But the key is to move it into areas where it can infiltrate into the soil where there's a tree root zone. So you work that with where you're planting. So you never put water up next to the, the building. You want to put it a few feet away, sometimes 10 or 20 feet away, depending on how much water you're talking about and the type of soil you have. Heavy clay soils need to have water harvesting areas further away from the building and from patios and from sidewalks, driveways. Heavier soils like that simply stay moist a long time and then they dry out and they often heave. Lighter soils where the grains are more coarse like sandy soils or gravelly soils, you don't have to take as much of a precaution but you still need to keep it away from any kind of structure or paving. You work that design with the design of your plants. So you sort of have to play off of each other. You have to massage where you need the trees. And you also want to make sure those trees are far enough that if there's any roots that develop that could heave your hardscape, they're less likely to do that further away. So that works out well for the water harvesting. And you also want to use higher water plants in low areas that catch water and lower water plants in high areas that shed water. You also want to plant far enough away from hardscape surfaces so that it doesn't look overgrown and weedy. A lot of designs I see, they're diverse, they have a wonderful group of plants, and they're, it's almost like you're walking through a jungle when you walk down the front sidewalk. And I think providing a little bit of a negative space or an open area, is, as non-architect people call it, makes all the difference and you plan for the mature size of plants. Now, water harvesting will get most low water use native species to your area, the ability to live on that rainfall. And only during droughts will you get dieback because when you're getting eight or nine inches of rain a year like we average, those drier years might only be four inches or five inches. Cactus can even die in four or five inches. You can have five of the same species of cactus in your huge backyard, and two of them will die, and three of them will live. Why is that? I don't know. It's why some people live to be 90 years old, and some people live to be 40. I, I don't know. They can both, that they can all be really healthy plants, or those two people can be specimens of fitness, bodybuilders, they eat perfectly, they have a nice balanced diet, and things happen. 
So that can happen to the plants, but just know that in drought years, even low water use native plants can die in the Southwest. So this is where drip and subsurface irrigation can come in. It's below grade. So it's not losing much to evaporation except on the surface of the soil. The drip emitters are below the grade, so you may not see them, but you'll certainly see once you dig down with a screwdriver, that's my favorite tool to use, and see if the soil is moist. And if you go down six inches or a foot and it's moist, they're working. If it's not, they're not working. And in the Southwest, we have a lot of calcium buildup in our water. Um, you hear about hard water, well, we're the capital of hard water. And you'll sometimes even see gray stains or whitish stains on gravel mulch between plants because that's the calcium coming to the surface and crystallizing. And that usually gets goes away with rainfall, which is another reason you want to have more dependence on rainfall and water harvesting than you do irrigation. But irrigation fills in the gaps when you're establishing the plant, which can take a growing season for most shrubs and wildflowers, and it can take two to three years on average for a tree. So sometimes it's good to have some kind of watering, and hand watering can be a pain unless it's a small yard. Now irrigation, the second place where it's useful is during our droughts. 2008 and 9, we had little winter precipitation, the monsoon season sort of failed. And 2010 and 11, it was dry everywhere. It wasn't as dry as the 1950s, but it was close. You are the first person that uh, I have heard refer to water as an herbicide. And yet, having lived most of my life gardening in dry or seasonally dry um, climates, I know exactly what you mean. Uh, please, please share a little bit about how you can potentially water too much or what watering in the wrong season can, how watering in the wrong season might result in killing some of your, your native plants. Well, I was very frustrated with a particular couple um, customers when I worked at a landscape contracting business, and this is 30 years ago. And then when I started my own business and I actually had signed agreements with, with design clients, they were so proud to tell me how this landscape uses so much less water than before. And I pointed out to them that these plants that are dying, there's too much water. I can actually smell the soil with some rot. You know, it's called when the soil goes anaerobic and there's no longer the oxygen that you need at the root zone. And you know, we're talking New Mexico and it's June and it hasn't rained in two or three weeks at all. And it's been 9,500 degrees every day. And I asked him, how much are you watering? Are, are you following my instructions? I started giving out written instructions and they said, we're watering, we've, we've cut back our watering quite a bit. We're now watering just twice a day for about 20 minutes. And I said, these plants can't handle this. They're all desert, they're all desert native and adapted and of course, they said, well, we didn't know that. And I said, we've talked about that the entire time, but they didn't, they honestly didn't make that connection. They just wanted their landscape done and built and, and growing in and, and their new home. And so I talked to the county extension agent at the time about that up there in Albuquerque. And I asked him, what about that? And he said, well, I always tell people that water is an herbicide because it kills more plants then people kill with Roundup even because they just water these dry loving plants too much. And I said, that's really clever. So I try to say that wherever I can. And most people go, oh, I know, but I just love the water. Isn't that crazy? But anyway, a lot of people do love the water. and Maybe they won't love to water when um, it costs too much and it's very prohibitive. Even my area, the water prices have gone up. 15, 20% in the six years I've lived here. Because where I am, we don't have municipal water from the city. I'm in the county. And so we have a private water supplier that's kind of quasi government because the government oversees private water companies, but they're also private. And of course, 
like cable TV, like internet improvements and adding infrastructure, it has its benefits, but it's gonna cost more. When I lived in Albuquerque, because people were using, they cut their per capita water use in the time I lived there from 220 gallons per person per day to 140 or 150 in that 20 years. That was mostly outdoor water use being cut. And at that time, the city grew from 500,000 to 900,000 wow. or 800,000 in the actual area that gets those that, that water um, from the municipality. Well, a lot of that was simply changing out the landscape from lawns, but I think people could have dropped a lot more. Santa Fe and Tucson are, and El Paso are three regional cities that have dropped water use beyond that because they use more water harvesting and they have a different mindset. But yeah, the city water rates actually went up because they had less revenue coming into the city coffers. So they had to raise the rates of water, not just because they're having to extend the line and keep it maintained, but because people are using less water. So it wasn't all because people were conserving, but that fed into it. Well, we are definitely seeing um, a, a sort of a financial driver, whether it's the cost of water or the availability of water. Um, both are factors in pushing people, especially in the West, towards um, native landscaping because it is a no brainer in terms of where you can conserve. Um, it, it's You can only shorten your showers so much, but you can plan a native landscape and really dial down your water use. So uh, we are seeing a, a lot of, of interest um, and it isn't necessarily um, tied to biodiversity loss or you know, the plight of the monarchs. Well, well those are both really uh, important uh, factors and, and issues. It, it isn't the only issue that is driving people towards um, embracing native landscaping. Uh, we want I to talk make a about really it. good point there, and I'd like to add to it real quickly, is that when people in the region started changing out lawns or gravel scaping, or it's just all gravel to more native species, you would think that there's less water input going into this garden now. This garden now is more diverse, and People that had never seen a roadrunner in their yard, which is our state bird, they're everywhere, <clears throat> started seeing them. Well, why? Roadrunners like lizards. A lizard to them is like a steak to a, a guy growing up on the farm in Nebraska. And they love lizards. And you'll often see, because they, from what I understand, roadrunners mate for life. You'll often see the female come running up to the male with a lizard in her mouth and her mate is on the other side of the fence <clears throat> or the other side of the patio and he'll get up and do this funny little happy dance and you'll <laughs> see the male doing the same thing. That's wonderful. That, that yes, yeah. you know, transitioning you see to- that with all kinds of birds. Suddenly you have birds in your landscape. You see hummingbirds and you didn't have that before. You have butterflies where you didn't before. And the positives are there. And I think as a designer, I always emphasize the aesthetics. Most people can't relate to a plant with chlorophyll nearly like they can relate to another being that flies, walks, whatever. And we need to talk about the wildlife interactions increasing by using native species much more because and I never thought about this until a fellow landscape architect who does that much more. He said, David, plants to most people are, they're so non-moving, they're so static compared to what we are because we can get up and walk and we can get in our car and drive around and we look at a plant and that looks nice. But when we see a hummingbird fly by, you know, four inches from your ear and go right to that Hesperalo flower or right to that Penstemon flower and buzz every one of them. It's really, 
that activates our senses. And I think that gets people to appreciate the native landscape much more and then want to do prevent more habitat loss and in fact, increase the abundance. Sorry, Brad Lancaster, I had to use that again, but it's, but it's true. Increase abundance and decrease, you know, the static nature of our properties and our land. And once people see that, they start valuing it. And you can, you can get the kids interested in it. You can get adults interested in it too. Well, for the folks who are going to be the DIYers, that they're, they're going to roll up their sleeves and undertake to do this design themselves, uh, what do they need to think about? What, how, what are the starting points? What are the things they need to consider at the outset before planting? Well, you want to study, you want to study how the sun moves. You want to study where it's shady, where it could be shady. You want to study where you want to be outside. I didn't do this in this landscape design as much as I might because of the configuration of the house, but often our houses were one story. You don't go on any steps to go in the front door. We often have courtyards and they're unused. In California, courtyards will have a fountain, they'll have lush plants. Well, ours should have our own lush native plants in them. And those are places where you want to um, spend time. So let's look at the function first and how it can be a place where we can extend our indoor living outdoors so it's an outdoor living area and then i would say where are wetter areas that's where we should use different plants than drier areas what area is really hot instead of trying to fight it maybe use plants that are more heat tolerant there look at your soil the most important half of the plant is in the soil it's the root system the top is really important because we see it but we won't see much of anything if the roots aren't happy. And the pH can be determined through private soil testing laboratories in New Mexico. I don't think the extension does that anymore. I think that's, a, that's something that you have to do um, through a private soil testing company. I can assure you that the pH is usually gonna be very alkaline here. It's usually running around, if you're lucky, it's 7.5 to 8, but it's usually 8 to 8.5. Oh, so, that is high. <laughs> but our plants like that. They think that's chocolate cake soil. They think a penstemon or an agave or a desert willow thinks an 8.5 pH soil with a lot of sand is what corn thinks central Iowa soil is. <laughs> it's so happy with it, it just can't control itself and grows beautifully. And it doesn't notice, need that herbicide of water constantly feeding it to make it happy. It can grow on our meager rainfall and an occasional splash from your drip system. I noticed you had alkali sacaton on your on your list. And I was like, yeah, that probably says a little bit about the pH of the, of the region. Um, you talk about happy roots. So um, for a gardener, who is looking to, to put in a garden um, and, and install a garden, is there anything that is needed to do to prep the soil or is what, what are Rarely. the soils like? You, you talked a little about clay and sand and is there anything that they should do to soil prep? I generally don't because unless you amend a huge area of it to grow vegetables, greens, plants like that, the tree roots are gonna go beyond it and the shrub roots are gonna go beyond that. In, in heavier clay soils, it'll hold water and that's not always good. But generally, the soil drains pretty well in more landscapes than not here in the Las Cruces area. So my recommendation is simply to not amend the soil, choose plants for that soil. And this is another place on that plant list. And we were talking about how the plant list and the overall design translates almost perfectly to this area at this latitude at this elevation. But when you move up to elevation to say Albuquerque and Socorro, Bernalillo, whatever, north of Albuquerque or Martha, Texas up on a plateau or some of the mountain foothill locations like Silver City, that you also need to look at the soil types because 
I chose plant species mostly that can grow in a variety of soil types, clay to sand to gravel, but some plants need deep well draining soils and will not grow on any kind of clay. We have a soil called caliche, which is a hard pan, and it's formed by the calcium in the soil that doesn't get leached. It doesn't form in every soil, but where it does, it is like concrete underneath the soil, and you need to break that up to get the tree roots through it. Uh, the other thing, the other type of soil we have between sandy and gravelly is we often have a layer of desert, it's called desert pavement, and it's the soil gets washed away over time, leaving some of the gravel on the surface, which is almost our model for landscaping. Most people want to use organic mulch that are from Eastern climates. And while that works at trees and lusher, leafier plantings with our more drought tolerant desert plantings, it isn't necessary. And it often solarizes and breaks down because of the sun before it adds nutrient value to the soil. But the gravel, actually provides an interface where the sun doesn't hit the soil. So the desert pavement acts as a gravel mulch. You'll never hear gravel mulch in most of the country, but here, that's what it is. And it confuses my clients from uh, Dallas, Texas, when I've had them um, doing large commercial projects, and they say, can't you just call it gravel? Because mulch isn't like that. And I said, so everybody understands it, I'll do that. <laughs> I know what it means. And so that's one of those things, being all things to all people. And start with your hardscape and your functional areas and work back to uh, your plantings. Well, speaking of planting, when is the best time to plant in Las Cruces? I think the best time is when there's the least stresses on a new plant that goes from that nursery pot. Even if it's grown right here in Las Cruces, it's never seen the gentle California seasons or the regular moisture of, you know, Louisiana or somewhere like that. Most of those, most of our plants wouldn't tolerate Louisiana, I don't think, very long anyway. But think about less water um, stress. You're going to want to go when it's not so hot. So probably any time between the end of the monsoon season, late August into September, all the way until March or April when it starts becoming windier and warmer and sometimes hot. Even if it's hot for a couple of days at the end of April or 1st of May can stress out a new plant. So if you give it a few months to establish that an eight or nine month period is really good from the end of the summer and the monsoon season to through the, you know, the early mid part of the spring. Below 90 degrees is ideal. You can't really control that sometimes in early October or late September, and you certainly can't control it in April and uh, early May. And the next thing is probably wind, which happens a lot in the spring, but I find that the heat is worse than the wind, but the wind does beat up plants pretty well. Most of our plants have small enough leaves that it's not too noticeable. The exception to this are real heat loving plants. We have a number of succulents. We call them accent plants or desert accents. Agaves, yuccas, dazzleriums, which are so tall. Uh, a lot of cactus, even little third cup cactus. They like heat. Some of our trees like heat too. Mesquites, acacias that are native in the area. They like to be planted when it's hot more than when it's cold, but they can take being planted when it's cold unless you get a really bad winter. But just wait till they can grow. The people around here that are using non-natives like palm trees, plant them in the summer, never plant things like that in the winter because they won't grow at all. And if they get any water, they can rot. And they can freeze out because they're not used to the soil being like that. But even our native plants, Give them a little boost. And only the cactus and the real heat requiring plants should be planted during the summer, March through October. I, I'm, not, I'm not saying summer begins in March, but from March to October, it's warm enough. Warm and windy, uh, that, that wind, um, I think definitely could be a factor. It just kind of wicks all the moisture out of the soil. And if uh, the plants don't have a strong root system, they're not gonna be able to, to reach what water is 
further down, further below. What kind of container, what, what size, I should say, container plants, um, if you're planting container plants, would you recommend? And are seeds an option? Are they just going to blow away? And, 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 and how, how would you sow seeds if you were going that route? I'll start with, I'll start with planting first, because it's usually the first item you do in sequence when you're implementing the garden design. And I recommend smaller container sized plants, just as, as was noted on the slide, you'd be surprised how many of my former colleagues as a landscape architect think that the larger the plant, the more it's going to survive. And that's simply not always true. Only specific locations like streetscapes where you have sidewalks, do you want to use a larger sized tree? Mostly you want to go with 15 gallon up to like a 24 inch box or one and a half inch caliper tree to plant. The reason is, is the larger the initial size of planting, the longer it takes for those roots from the nursery to interface with the soil and start binding in it and growing. Uh, this brings up the second point, which is seeds, but I'll, I'll finish off with smaller container plant sizes. I like to use one gallon and five gallons for plants other than trees, but if the trees are farther away, you have much greater availability of species in five gallon sizes than you do sometimes in 15, and then you definitely do when you get into the two inch caliper and three inch caliper. If you have a larger budget and you can find native trees in larger sizes and you want immediate impact and you're prepared for them taking longer to establish and possibly not establishing and you have to replant, then use a larger specimen size tree. We don't have a lot of those here in New Mexico. That's more of an Arizona thing because they actually salvage a lot of large trees. It's part of their state law. They have a native plant salvage law for certain species. But over here, 15 gallon is optimal and even five gallon for trees if they're away from where there's a lot of traffic and they'll grow faster and establish faster. I can tell you from personal experience, I've used five gallon honey mesquites. I've used 24 inch box mesquites at my own house. These two projects were about half a mile apart. Within two years, the five gallons were outgrowing the 24 inch box. They were up to six and seven feet tall. The others had hardly budged. It took three more years for those honey mesquites in the 24 inch box to start growing. The five gallons just kept growing. And then one to five gallon for ornamental grasses, you know, your different clump grasses, your wildflowers, perennials, uh, shrubs and your desert accents. Some of the desert accents are very expensive now because they were not so hip 25 years ago. Now everybody wants them and the nurseries can't grow enough of them. So what we're seeing is an issue availability and price. The five gallons cost what big specimen size cost except for their accent plants and they're tiny they're like six inches across four inches across and they cost what in a in a five gallon what you'd expect to pay for a 15 gallon tree now and so you may have to start by just the fact that the market hasn't brought forth the availability because they can't keep up with the demand so plant one and five gallons mostly and just expect them to take off and there's different sayings, but I always tell people the first year or two of a landscape that's planted, you don't see much change. On the, the second or third year, it's kind of like a teenager. A lot of acne and zits, and it doesn't look so good, looks kind of frumpy. And then one day, it's usually on the third year, all the plants start looking good. They come into their start to, start to mature at that point. Longer for trees less time for smaller plants. And then seeding, which is our second planting option, I use it to reestablish grasses, wildflowers, and I time it in our area when it's less stressful. Just like we talked about planting when it's consistently below 90, well, seeding, we want it to be 
at the growing season for that seed. If it's a warm season grass, like most of ours are in New Mexico, they're timed with the summer rains or the monsoon season. So there's really no point in seeding them in March, April, May, June, probably July. Wait till August. And that'll give time for the seed to establish. I've I, at my old house in Albuquerque and on a number of jobs, I actually used penstemon seed from our de various native penstemons and desert marigolds. I seeded them in September. And people said, well, won't they freeze when they come up? And I said, well, no, they have a couple months to go, but that's just a light freeze anyway. By the time, by the time winter comes along in December or the end of November, they're already starting to grow. But half of them aren't going to do anything that first year. They won't even grow in the spring. The next fall, the next late summer, they'll start growing. So some of those seeds will lay dormant for a whole year after you seeded them. And then they're fine. And sure enough, that's what always happened in all of my projects that I worked on where I saw the installation. So seed it with the rainy season and everything good will probably happen more likely then. If you try to do it earlier, birds will pick off the seed. They might wash away, but the washing away isn't nearly as much as birds picking them off or they remain dry too long. Excellent. That, that's, that's how I look at it. Yeah, no, that's great advice. And, and in addition to the timing of the water, the soil is a lot warmer in those months um, and, and the roots are going to be happy. And that's where the roots, you know, that's what what's growing. You say you don't see a lot of up, above ground growth those first season or two and and it's because they're investing in their roots and and if the soil is warm the roots are a lot happier that's exactly it and this is more of a design question but as far as how you mass things plants what you're really doing is you're mimicking what works in the wild which happens to be what most people like visually so by planting in masses or blocks or drifts you often see that's how plants grow you won't see a desert willow here in las cruces growing haphazardly up on a high area you're going to see several of them growing down an arroyo or a dry wash where the extra rainfall occurs and soaks into the soil because if they do escape somewhere else they're usually really small and shrubby. They, they're usually shorter than a human being, but when you see them down where the water connects, those, those water courses, even though they're dry, have moisture below the surface much longer than up above those water courses, those arroyos. And that's where you start seeing lines of these desert billows growing or mesquites or whatever the native tree is that we're talking about, or even shrubs. And that happens to look good to a lot of people too. I find that a lot of landscapes that weren't designed well, where they were just using one of everything they liked in a garden, like the old cottage gardens, those often don't, they can be really spectacular because you have so many things packed in. Well, here in the desert, there's not enough water and a lot of those plants, it's going to be survival of the fittest and a lot of those plants will die out. So you'll have bare patches that you would have had anyway. And then you don't have any visual continuity. And I've I, I've told this to a few people, some don't understand it, but I say that no place in the natural world, even when it's super abused, looks as bad as some poorly designed gardens. So half of your design should be designing the garden on the items, how you want it to function and how you want it to look. And half of the design is subtracting out the unnecessary things that make it cluttered. And you'll still have a diversity. I mean, I had to go back on this design for a couple hours and cut out about five or six plant species because it wasn't harmonious enough and shift some things around. And I've been doing this since 1988. So, you know, for, for a living. So I'm doing it, you know, full time <laughs> every week and full time to a landscape architect or designer is often a 50 or 60 hour week. It's kind of a if you care, you end up spending a little <laughs> more time than you got paid on. And that works that works great when your employer is paying you by the hour, but they're usually not. And when you're self-employed, it cuts into your vacation time, seeing your wife, whatever. 
Well, we appreciate certainly the the, the work and, and time you put into this design. And, and yeah, it feels good to know that that even an, a, a tenured experienced designer needs to edit their own work. <laughs> They're like, oh, no, wait, too much, too much. They need to re revisit. And maybe it's a case of, okay, I'm just going to put it put it away for a week, come back to it and go, what was I thinking? Um, you mentioned those those dry or those, I should say, those bare spots, not, I mean, I'm sure it's all dry, but the but bare spots. And, and let's talk a little bit about the opportunistics and in, in a, opportunists in a, in a windy climate, you're going to have weeds, you're going to have weed pressure, you're going to have stuff blown in from who knows where. Um, so can we talk a little bit about the do's and don'ts in terms of weed control for that area, what you recommend? Yeah. And that sounds great. And I'll, I'll start with one thing that I forgot to write down on my uh, cheat, cheat sheet. And that is the, um, it's the use of weed fabric or filter fabric, as some people call it, or weed barrier. Weed seeds blow and we get a lot of wind, especially in the spring, as we've talked about several times. And if you don't believe it, come visit me in March or April those weed seeds blow in that wind as well. We probably have weed seeds blowing from 100 miles away that get caught up in the wind and the sand blowing because it's pretty open land right down I-10 all the way to Tucson. And it's really amazing to see on filter fabric or weed barrier, it forms a nice barrier that actually keeps moisture from reaching into the soil as well. And weeds that are really strong, like Bermuda grass and nightshades, nightshades actually a native plant, but you may not want it everywhere in your landscape. It's very opportunistic, grows from rhizomes and stolons, mostly rhizomes. And it will, or Bermuda grass will inch its way up through the gaps on the filter fabric or weed barrier. It holds more moisture right at the surface. And those weed seeds blow into the rock in almost every landscape that I've seen more weeds than not, there's weed barrier under it. They only prevent bindweed and some of these perennial weeds that come back year after year, sometimes nightshade, but bindweed, but they don't do it forever. It's best to use other methods. And I'm not going to go into that because it'll take a while to describe some of the different things you can do with cardboard sheeting or just solarizing, there's other things you can do without having to use Roundup, but it takes time. My opinion is, from so many projects, is don't use any weed fabric. Now, you mentioned mulches do a couple things. They conserve water. In the east, you can have 100% plant cover because there's usually enough water to allow that. Here, you get dry spots because the plants use up what little bit of water. And if you're overwatering, you know, you're using water as an herbicide, you can sometimes create dry spots and gaps in your plants because the desert plants can't take all that water. So there's a dead plant, there's a plant missing. There's a five foot area in your garden that's been given water like it's a lawn grass in Oklahoma. And now suddenly this desert plant doesn't like that you can solve the problem by either planting a really high water use plant because the plants that I use aren't tough enough to handle your overwatering or you can change your watering scheme. Mulches help hold the moisture in. They conserve that moisture. They help decrease that erosion and they make it a little harder for the weed seed to germinate. We said the filter fabric or weed barrier provides a nice artificial surface, it basically pumps up the volume for those weed seeds to germinate because there's also a lot of sand and dirt that blows in between those rocks. When you don't have that anymore, trapping that and the soil can move freely down below, you have less opportunity for weed growth. And by keeping the plants that you want happy, like you'd see in nature where it's not disturbed, the same thing happens over time, but it takes time. Notice that I use the word time a lot. Give it some time and pull some of those weeds and know what's a weed and what's not. And then I mentioned pruning trees and shrubs. That's almost as bad as the herbicide of overwatering. I can't believe how many people want a low maintenance garden. I can't tell you how many times I've been asked for that. 
And then they ask, well, what am I supposed to do out here? Should I shape these plants? And I always tell them, no, the shape they have is fine. And if you design, this is a design question too, if you design for the plant's mature size, you'll rarely have to do much other than removing some dead root, some dead wood out of it. And in the case of a tree, train it so it can be large enough that you can walk under or sit under, whatever your purpose is for that tree. Some of our trees grow right down to the ground. And if you're not going to walk under them, let them do that because it helps stabilize them against what happens when you get a big windstorm with thunder, you know, a thunder shower, or whatever, in the afternoon during the summer. It actually helps to stabilize and balance the plant better. If you prune them up too much, sometimes there can be a problem. It's all balanced. It's only to optimize plant health and growth. It is never to satisfy a particular aesthetic preference, mostly because you've seen all your neighbors do it. That's a really bad reason to prune anything or shape anything. You should never even use hedge trimmers with anything other than a hedge. And you should never do sharp pruning to a tree, which is called pollarding, unless you really know what you're doing. And you cut those branch ends with the knowing, with, with, with the understanding that you're going to be maintaining that for eternity, as long as that tree is alive. Most plants don't need that. Those are special uses, hedges, and they're fine, but hedges and pollarding, that's the only time you'll ever do that. Most of our maintenance that I see in landscapes is because the designer designed too many plants, the city code required too many plants, and the designer had to do that to get paid, the, and the plants to get approved, or too large of the plants were put into a small space. And, excellent. Uh, yeah, excellent comments and insight. Uh, I do think that that structurally, I mean, the desert plants, they are like no other in terms of some of the shapes and textures that you get. You have on your plant list, one of my very favorite grasses, the giant sacaton. That, that is just a gorgeous grass. And so, yes, it pains me when I see those chopped down for no good reason other than it was planted in the wrong place and they needed to maintain sight lines or something like that. So good that, that you're thinking in terms of mature size and yeah, being mindful that these plants are gorgeous all on their own. They do not need us to fuss over them. <laughs> yeah, that's the whole, that was the reason why you landscape to see you have something that's more beauty and less water or just better aesthetics. And you'd be surprised how many people feel like they need to keep everything super neat. It's just as bad as people that don't maintain anything. Nature maintains itself beautifully. And our whole goal is to create this regenerative garden that replicates nature, but it's designed to work with our architecture. So it's going to be stylized to how we like things, if we like things more spare, we like things more minimal, we like things more abundant and growing together and touching. If the garden design doesn't relate to the intent, it's it's usually going to fail. It's gonna create more work than we need. And grasses are the number one thing that I'm starting to see people um, cut back when they don't need to. The city crews here often cut back grasses the moment they go dormant in November. And so you're left with a sea of every six feet or four <laughs> feet, a crew cut or a little dome. And you didn't need to do that. And when you cut grasses back to rejuvenate them, it's not gonna be but every few years. And you're not gonna do it until the spring starts growing and you're gonna cut them all the way to the surface, which is very hard. And you can't do that with hedge trimmers. They're gonna go throwing rocks up at you when you do that. So right there, quit making extra work for yourself and instead enjoy the abundance. And if it's well-designed, you're going to get a lot more of enjoyment out of it than you are going to be constantly deadheading everything and constantly cutting back grasses and shrubs to be two feet tall. The easiest thing is to plant something that gets two feet tall. Now you don't don't fight do it. it. And then something I forgot to mention, but you say provide seed and shelter for birds. See, it's not just about us. It's about these organisms being able to find something to eat and some shelter. These organisms need lots of shelter in Wisconsin in the winter, 
They need it in Colorado, they need it in Tucson, and they need it in Las Cruces too. It's the same need that we people have. We want to have some kind of shelter. And to wildlife, this is shelter. And so a curved billed thrasher comes into your yard every evening in the fall and takes mesquite seeds and tries to drive them into the ground. And you're going to get a few seedlings come up next year. They're also eating because they can't go to the grocery store. There's no Albertsons for a curved billed thrasher or a roadrunner. So the roadrunner can't you know, can't go to the fancy restaurant where they serve um, shrimp cocktails or rattlesnake cocktails. They just get their own out of the wild. And so if you have some shelter um, for, these, for, for these creatures, you're going to be a lot better off. And you're usually not going to have a problem with as many rodents, as many insects in the house, if you have a better stable, rounded ecosystem outside of your house. Excellent. I want to talk a little bit about, and, and you mentioned earlier, uh, some of the cost savings of um, using uh, smaller size containers, planting smaller size containers, going with seeds. Um, but if you could talk a little bit about how one might phase in the installation of this garden. Many of us don't have the time or resources to do it all at one go. And so any recommendations you have about how that might be done in stages? Well, this is really good because you have the slide up with it too. This is my unlandscaped backyard. There is nothing in here except that one agave at the on the bottom picture <clears throat> that I uh, planted. It's not even staying there. It's just there because somebody gave it to me. And I'm going to plant it in probably a container or somewhere else. Start with your hardscape and your walls and your grading. When you start with that, you should have already thought out where you want your trees to go. Most people don't do that. The trees, remember, are going to grow best where there's some kind of water harvested lower areas and some of your other plants that will grow to the trees. So plan all that out first. Plan out where your use areas are, where you want to have a patio, where you want to have a, a simple informal gravel area that you could set some chairs in and a fire pit like on the design, has that in the backyard. And then build off of that, plant your larger income, uh, income. Well, they are larger income a lot of times because they cost more. Larger impact plants, trees, some shrubs that are going to make a visual impact and then plant your wildflowers and your seeding last. The only seeding I would do initially is if you have a grassland you're trying to replicate. We have some up against the mountains where I live. I'm getting 15 inches of rain a year up there as opposed to the eight down here. The seeding can help to control erosion on some of those slopes. Usually we use seeding under a thin one inch layer of rock. That seems to be one of the best ways to get seed to establish. And that's the only time you would seed first. You usually do it afterwards. Mulch around those plants. If you just have trees, mulch around the trees and then know that you're going to address the rest of the landscape later when you have more funds. But you should design the landscape first, then put in your hardscape, your, wa your water harvesting basins or rain gardens and your trees and then work out to smaller plants. Larger impact function first, smaller impact details second. And you can even phase out the sides of the landscape. The front yard could go in first. A lot of times people move into an area like I am. And if the builder doesn't give you their landscape, which usually isn't ideal, um, you have to do it. And that might be the first place you landscape and then do the back, do the sides third. And that's about how I tend to approach it, both from when I'm designing on paper to when I'm implementing in the actual land on the property. Well, thank you for all the down to earth advice and um, and just real world applications that, that you've shared with us. Are there anything we didn't touch on or any closing thoughts that you have that you wanna chime in with? Yeah, I would say work with the environment you have, embrace it. To quote another person who's doing a Wild Ones design, Put your desert eyes on. 
what's called a tree in the eastern half of the country that gets huge would be called um, probably unavailable here or impossible to grow from, in most cases. What people in the east would call a shrub, which has more than one trunk, we can call a tree because that's how our trees grow. They're not competing for sunlight here. They're actually trying to outcompete each other for water, so they spread out. Think in those terms. Put your desert eyes on. Lollipops are for Halloween candy handout, not for trees. That's not how our desert trees grow. They usually have more than one stem. And even in areas where you're going to have a lot of foot traffic and you need an upright tree, let it grow more naturally instead of trying to prune it to become straight up like, you know, a uh, a, a, a transmission antenna or something of that nature or a lollipop and allow plants to grow give them their maturity um their space to really mature a five foot shrub needs to be in an area larger than five feet if you have an a, a pet for example you would not use a kennel for a chihuahua to put your rottweiler in doesn't work well out, doesn't work that way, especially with a Rottweiler, it might bite you. You might want to give it a kennel the size of a Rottweiler and then don't keep it in there very long. They don't get, they're not very happy with that, just like we wouldn't be. It's just thinking in terms of empathy for what our plants and our gardens have to go through and do more with less and spend the extra time designing a landscape to undesign it a little bit and refine it by taking some things out that are not necessary. It'll have a more serene effect. And that's where I see the most effective landscapes and gardens when they're not too overly fussy. Now, if you have 10 acres of land and you wanna have a botanic garden, go at it. But each area in that botanic garden needs to be serene and needs to be unified well. Wonderful. Even though you have 15 different areas and your house, you got a front and a back and a couple of sides probably. So treat those accordingly and spend the time to reduce the design to what's necessary and what gives you the most bang for the buck. And that's about what I would say. And treat water as your friend, not as a nuisance and not as a herbicide. <laughs> and don't over maintain. See, I said one more thing and then I came up with five more. Well, that's how it is. Um, when when you live this, I mean, it is your profession. It's your passion, and we thank you, thank you so much for for sharing uh, all of your talent, your expertise in the development of this design, and for walking us through this today. And I do want to point out that David's Las Cruces design and the other designs, um, the designer notes that go with them, the plant list, the um, list of regional native plant nurseries can all be found on online at nativegardendesigns.wildones.org. And your feedback helps us to continually improve our webinars. So we appreciate you taking the time to complete a short survey after you view this program. Thank you again, David, for joining us. And we hope that you viewers all feel inspired and empowered to plant more native plants in your community. Thank you, David. And I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you.